Graham, nice to meet you. Thanks so much for your time. You were due to speak at the Hagley Oval until the facility operated by Venues Autotahi pulled the plug saying they didn't have the resources for you. What did you make of that? And do you believe them? Uh, I, I, I don't. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, the Free Speech Union over here is now primed to uh, investigate these uh, claims when they're made and pull them up on it when they're not true. Uh you know, I've had my, I've had, I've had every excuse: security concerns, uh, your values don't align with ours. Um, you know, the, every everything under the sun. Never uh, the truth, which is we think you're a bigot, and uh, we don't want you to speak. Uh, so, um, you know, I've had now six years of fighting this stuff, so I'm kind of used to it. Um, it. It used to upset me, but now, now it just rolls off my back. And uh, the Free Speech Union, we're expecting it as well. So they always have another venue lined up, you know. Well, they have to, I suppose. Well, speaking of uh, the, the comments suggesting you're a beggar, let's just talk about that briefly, because I know there was one article that said uh, a self-proclaimed um, anti-hate speech activist uh, said your New Zealand tour helps ensure hate speech and transphobia are platformed. And I wonder mm. what your response to that was. What, what do you make of those comments, Graham? Well, again, I've had that sort of thing for the last six years, and it's a funny way to speak about someone who wants uh, fair sports for women, um, children not to be experimented on uh, in gender clinics, uh, women not to lose their livelihoods for objecting to it. Uh, but what can you do? It is the water we, we swim in where uh, a, a kind of self-selecting group of people who call themselves trans uh, and are often not transsexual um, have decided to make any criticism, any scrutiny, um, any attempt to talk about the uh, situation at all uh, hateful. And the reason they do that is because this movement can't stand any scrutiny, any scrutiny and it all falls apart. Graham, you talk about uh, some of these activists don't like to be scrutinised or don't like to be challenged or criticised. Why do you think that is? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a few things going on. Um, and, you know, on one level, I think a lot of young people think that this is the next gay rights. And they think that they can take the, the trans uh issue and and just put it over gay rights as if it's tracing paper and it will be exactly the same and it's not exactly the same because gay people uh can be gay without the involvement of anyone else whereas trans people have to uh, com uh compel our speech um uh and actually have to try and compel the way we think uh by uh obvious men uh, insisting that they uh, that we call them women um and vice versa and it's uh, it's it's not it's not the same. It's actually it involves a lot of innocent people who uh, are not trans, who are suffering from a very very explicable and understandable uh, uh, distress about their own body, because we are in a world where pornography, hardcore pornography, is is widely available, and a lot of these kids are traumatized by what they've seen in it. So a lot of young girls, for instance, seem to be trying to escape their sex body because uh, of what they associate with it. So it's 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 not only uh, it may they may consider it rude or, uh, or or bigoted to talk about these issues, but it is absolutely essential if we care about gay people. Um, when you put that tracing paper uh, of trans over the over the gay issue. Uh, what you're actually doing is you're misrepresenting something very important because we know, for instance, there are far too many men on date, lesbian dating apps um, who are kind of uh, uh, imposing themselves there. Uh, there's women on gay dating apps who are actually straight, who've been told that gay men will accept them if they have secondary sex characteristics like a mustache or, or facial hair that, that happens because of testosterone. And those women are, are, are you know, are, are the victims of a terrible lie because gay men are only interested in other gay men, no matter what they say. Well, despite you promoting yourself as being cancelled, uh, you've maintained a pretty strong presence in the New Zealand media landscape for the past week promoting this this tour. Does that suggest that actually you're not entirely cancelled or does it suggest that being cancelled and then 
now you're uncancelled, so it's not such a bad thing at the end of the day? Uh, it's a good question, but, you know, in the six years that I haven't written any comedy, um, I've had things like, you know, a, a, a musical uh, of the of my show, Father Ted, uh, cancelled because my colleagues on the show uh, tried to give me £200,000 to take my name off it, and I refused. Um, and I have lost opportunities to work with people like Steve Martin. Uh, I've lost opportunities to uh, to write a play that would have toured alongside one of my favorite farces, Black Comedy by Peter Schaefer. Um, so I, the only thing I was able to do was write a book, which took two years and for which I wasn't paid in advance because my publishing house is so small that they couldn't pay me in advance. So um, I've been kind of getting through the last six years on the, by the skin of my teeth. Uh, but I think, yeah, there is a second. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. When I was writing it, I was thinking um, the book is half of the story. The other half I will do in interviews like this, because in my first draft, I was filling it with everything I knew about this issue. And, uh, I, I, you know, it was getting too heavy with that kind of material because it's supposed to be a memoir. And this uh, this situation I've been in has only lasted for the last six years of my life. So it's a very small part. So the first 70 percent of the book is, is about comedy and, and all that sort of thing. And the thir last 30 percent is what happened to me up until you know, speaking to you, uh, nearly, you know, so, um, uh, so, but I, but, but I do think that, yes, like that was the plan. I knew that if I wrote a book, they would have to speak to me. Uh, and up until this, and you know, you, I've had some very reluctant book programs, uh, talking to me, you know, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm hoping this is, this was a way out of the darkness, you know, um, Graham, but I'm just wondering, when was the do you do you recall the pivotal moment for you when you know you are highly critical of um, some transgender issues? Do you remember the moment where you thought this is something I'm prepared to die for, so to speak? Because essentially, you know, with respect, um, your marriage fell apart. I understand because of your openness to these issues or speaking about it. Uh, you lost much of your comedic career, if you just explained. Was there a moment where you thought, stuff it, this is what I believe strongly in, and I'm going to go forward with this, regardless of it, um, regardless of the consequences that have been so huge for you and your family? Yes, and I'm not even sure. I think I, I think I put it in the book, but now that you asked the question, I, I actually, uh, I actually realised that this is what it was. Um, I was, I was out at a, an event, a Let Women Speak event, it probably was, because that's where I met most of um, the people involved in this. And I met a man who uh, was an alcoholic, uh, had, 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 um, had, had uh, you know, been, had stopped drinking for a good long time, uh, but was just back from a two-week bender, as he described it, because his daughter uh, had started taking testosterone and there was nothing he could do about it. And she, her face was changing, her, her voice was deepening, and he knew all the facts about testosterone. He knew that it would increase her risk of heart attack. He knew that it would increase her uh, risk of osteoporosis. Um, uh, all these things just uh, knocked him back into, into a, a, a spate of alcoholism. And when I spoke to him, and he described seeing his daughter disappear before his eyes, I realized I couldn't, I couldn't step back from it. How old was his daughter? Uh, I think she was about 16, 17. You know, I, I, I'm not sure, actually. I can't say for sure, but it was a, she was young. She was definitely below 20. Doctors who specialise in transgender healthcare have uh, arguably been exposed this or last week in the UK, admitting privately that patients are sometimes too young uh, to fully understand the consequences of their treatment. This is, of course, for those not are not up to speed with us. This is from leaked messages from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Reveals how medics, thank you, uh, reveals how medics acknowledge behind the scenes that teenagers given puberty blocking drugs do not always fully realise that perhaps they couldn't have children. Children. These were leaked files that a lot of media didn't really pick up on. I think GB News did at one stage, though. Um, leaked files. 
What do you make it? What do you make of that? Did you feel sort of vindicated? Yes. Well, m- m- my friends and I always knew about it, um, uh, except we'd never had it uh, uh, presented so baldly. Uh, uh, most of the WPATH files consists of leaked emails between doctors forum conversations between doctors and it just reveals that they are making up transgender medicine as they go along and it reveals that they also know what the bad effects are going to be um and they either are shrugging it off or um uh or just kind of talking about it as if it's uh, a minor inconvenience uh, a nuisance and the most important thing is that they do what these children are telling to, them to do which is to give them the drugs immediately in fact there was one incredible uh, letter that said that the one woman said she or one doctor at wpath said uh, she only regrettably turned down one patient and that's because that patient was having uh, hallucinations during the assessment now the thing that shocked me about that was the word regrettably she actually thought she should have given these these drugs to to this person who was uh, having a psychotic episode so these are not doctors these are um very dangerous ideologues who uh are uh quoted as being best practice by uh organizations like the NHS in the UK and whatever the equivalent is here i'm sorry i should have looked that up um but like it, it, it the uh, when you question this everyone just resorts to oh well wpath you know the, the, it's peer reviewed studies it's this and that and it's nothing of the sort it's a, it's it's a it, it's been described as a live experiment on children and the, the last thing i'll just say there is um you know even though they call it a live experiment they don't follow up there's no follow up on these kids so they don't actually know what effect the testosterone or cross sex hormones are having uh to kids who've been doing it for 10 years or 15 years and that generation is just about to is just about i have a feeling now what we're going to see is um uh, a lot of legal cases you know against the nhs uh, against american surgeons and i think that that really will be the end of it i think the w path files is the end of this movement well, in fact, following uh, the NHS decision to stop prescribing puberty blockers to children with gender dysphoria, this was at least reported by the media, uh, this announcement I think was made only last week, wasn't it, or even the, the end of last week. Do you also feel vindicated in your concerns about their safety now? Because the NHS has said, we're going to stop. I mean, that's a major call to actually say that. So it's almost admitting uh, guilt in some respects, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yesterday I, I tweeted a video of um, Ellen Page or Elliot Page, as, as she's known now. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a video of, of Ellen, but when she speaks now, she has a very croaky voice. Uh, and the reason for that is because her vocal cords have been swelled by testosterone, but her throat is still a woman's throat, a slender woman's throat. And so it, some of these people it will hurt uh, them to speak for the rest of their lives. So, you know, we've known about all these issues for years. I have a friend over here, Elaine Miller, a Scottish um, uh, physical therapist, and uh, she says that all these young girls who are on testosterone will go into the menopause sometimes 20 to 30 years too early. So the menopause is no joke. The menopause brings with it incontinence, dementia, uh, and brittle bones. So all these young girls who've been lied to, who've been told that they will turn into young men, are actually turning into old women. As a result, though, of that, do you accept, though, that at, at a certain age when somebody is an adult, or perhaps they're, you know, they're fully past puberty and they're you know, 18, 19 years of age, they shouldn't could and should be able to make decisions for themselves, and if they feel they're in the wrong body, then so be it, and let them do what they want to do as long as they're happy? Of course, but but the problem is the lack of information. Uh, there is a taboo about speaking about these issues within the trans community. It's seen as disloyal. It's seen as harming trans people. So the uh, conversations that need to happen are not happening. And these, these kids, as a result, are not only um, getting no information, they're getting deliberately wrong information from other people who you know, for a variety of reasons, they want to, uh, they might want to make, they want to, they might want to fool themselves that their own decision was a good one. And so they gloss over the problems that they're having. But we have, uh, there's one, um, 
there's one uh, 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 trans man, which is a woman who has uh, with a trans identity in Ireland, who's been advising uh, uh, the government for years. No Halpin, their name is, and No Halpin seems to always be tweeting either to or from the hospital. You know, so these uh, uh, decisions, yeah, absolutely. If you're an adult, you can do whatever you want. You know, but um, uh, but. For God's sake, we've got to get the right information. We have to make sure that people know what they're getting into, because at the moment they're getting an incredibly romanticized view of it. In the UK as well, there was one magazine, Pink News, which has run over 75 hit pieces on me and countless hit pieces on J.K. Rowling, teamed up with Snapchat to do a a kind of promotion of... um, uh, double mastectomies, you know, this is the most extraordinarily reckless and horrific thing to do uh, and not tell these kids that the their chests will never have feeling up here again. You know, these kids don't know that the nipples have to be taken off and then reattached uh, after the operation. They don't know all these things, you know, um, and the result of that is a lot of parents are being pressured into uh, letting their kids do these uh, procedures. And then if the parents say no, at 18 years old, they're, they're, they rock it out as if from a catapult to whatever clinic they can find to get it done themselves. So yes, by all means, be an adult, uh, do what you like. Although I, I think if we were talking about cutting off our legs, we, the conversation would be slightly different. But um, uh, but please be informed. That's all I'm saying. Speaking of um, uh, parents, just a couple of final questions, Graham. Uh, a professor of psychology criticised the parents of some young trans children for portraying their care as self-sacrificing for social approval or words to that effect. Do you agree with that assessment or partially? Yes, and I don't agree with it. I don't, I don't believe that there's such a thing as trans children. I think there's children with dysphoria um, and that covers a wide range of, <clears throat> and it's mainly, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say 99%, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say 99% of the time uh, it contains people who are just going through perfectly normal distress uh, at their uh, at their growing bodies, uh, distress that most of us felt when we were going through that stage, and uh, every doctor agrees, every every responsible uh, uh, doctor agrees that the best cure for that distress is to actually go through puberty. Puberty is a time where you're discovering who you are and what uh, puberty blockers do is they stop you discovering that and they hold you in a kind of arrested state of childhood Um, and they're not reversible this is another disgraceful thing that happened over the last few years Uh, you know we had a a doctor in the UK head of GIDS uh, Dr Polly Carmichael who appeared on a children's TV program and told children that the drugs were fully reversible and then admitted that, that that she didn't know either way. I mean, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, abdication of, of duty from doctors whose first principle should always be first do no harm. After a, a trans or a self-proclaimed trans activist's false claims on national television news that sparked a protest, you know about this, Posey Parker. Yes. Uh, despite a later correction by the broadcaster, who who bears responsibility for ensuring the public uh, reaction? Is it the activist or the media? Well, I think actually it's the, it's the police really that should be uh, most on top of this. Um, the, but I have actually seen the police used... And, and I'm afraid, even though they, they really changed and they got a lot better in the UK, uh, it was possibly only because once I was walking up to a protest in which uh, a group of about 30 or 40 women were surrounded by a baying mob of, of trans activists, almost kettled in. Um, and I filmed a, I managed to catch a film of about 12 police officers walking away from uh, the event Uh, and I said where are they going and they said oh they're off for lunch and there are about six policemen keeping these these uh, activists away from the women and so I think what has 
been happening is that policemen who were as confused by this issue as everyone else had started to try and use these activists almost like you'd use Dobermans during crowd control to frighten these women, to make sure they don't come out again so that they are dissuaded from talking about their rights. And I think that's exactly what happened in New Zealand. Um, I think that the uh, the security was deliberately lax uh, when 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 Pope Posey, after the event, was shaken and terrified after what had happened to her, they quickly spirited her out of the country, saying that she wasn't safe, and she believed them, and she left. Um, and I think it was just part of the plan. So I'm very very happy that all that backfired, and I, I know that it really awakened a lot of awareness of this issue in New Zealand, and uh, that's another reason why this tour has been so successful for me. You know, um, it's a lot of people who have who have you know had their eyes opened. Uh, unfortunately, it took violence to do it. It feels like perhaps everything goes round in circles or comes full circle during the pandemic. I know it's the same in parts of the UK and Ireland. Uh, that there was a there was the thought process that if you speak out against the government, you are seen as being anti-vax or anti-this or anti-what have you now. But there seems to be a public uh, pushback on that now. Uh, do you agree with that? That that public sentiment's changing. That people are feeling more inclined to actually speak out and so what they think without uh, worried about being called a racist, a bigot, a homophobe. Those types of easy quick hit labels? Yeah, absolutely. I think the problems associated with all these events are uh, too apparent for people to ignore them. And as a result, people are getting more and more frustrated by a political class and a celebrity class that broadcasts without without engaging. So people say the usual, um, you know, in my in my fight, uh, the phrases you hear are, are the phrases you hear are sort of meaningless phrases like trans rights or human rights, as if anyone is disagreeing with that. Um, uh, but they always turn off replies, so you can't engage. So you can't say, well, what about prisons? What about sports? You know, what about rape crisis centres? Uh, all of these things, uh, uh, it is perfectly clear what's happening in them. Um, and so far, the political class has been able to ignore it all. So uh, I, I am actually worried, though. I'm very worried because, it, you know, if another pandemic comes along that has a slightly different, um, you know, uh, uh, a set of uh, uh difficulties with, or a set of problems with it, set of dangers with it, um, then it's going to be so much harder to get the public to pull together because we've lost all faith in the media. You know, we, we, we have the media lying to our faces. So I'm, I'm very nervous that when the time does come for a huge push where we need to engage with each other in good faith to, to help uh, uh, avert a terrible situation, we won't be able to. Yep, and the media's only got themselves to blame, frankly. Graham, it's been lovely to speak with you. I know that for more information, uh, you you are actually doing a public talk uh, tomorrow here in Christchurch. For more information, people can head to the Free Speech Union website, uh, email um, organisers to find out where that location is. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure.